All right, well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's episode of The Jason Lodar Show. It's so good to have all of you here today. Welcome. Thank you for being here. So for today's episode, I wanted to talk about three primary topics. Number one, the push for diversity within <clears throat> classical Christian education, specifically diversity within curriculum and diversity within the canon of the Western tradition, so the great books of the West. And then I want to talk after that about a quote I came across in a book that I am reading that I wanted to share with you and comment on about entertainment within the church and the focus on entertainment and emotional things like that within the church, uh, emotional experiences. And then lastly, I want to read you something I wrote about a Gospel Coalition article about Taylor Swift. So <clears throat> with that being said, let's jump right into it and talk about uh, divert the push for diversity within classical Christian education. So one of the battles that's been raging the past year or so regarding or within classical Christian educational circles is diversity of curriculum and diversity of the great books tradition and the canon of the Western tradition. And the idea is that the canon of the great books and many curriculum, the, uh, yeah, various curriculum that classical Christian homeschoolers and schools use are too Eurocentric, too male, and too white. So the call is for diversification to make it more female more black, more Hispanic, more whatever, more and, and less European in its scope. And same thing with the curriculum, with the books that we read and things of that sort. And so there's, there's essentially, there's two options out there, kind of two primary options. There's more than two, but there are two primary options in response to this. Number one is obviously capitulation and to say yes to it. Say, okay, certainly we'll, we'll diversify, we'll make the curriculum less white, less male, less Eurocentric, and we'll start incorporating authors from other parts of the world and with different color skin than somebody like I have. But naturally, one of the questions then becomes, okay, well, how diverse? What's the goal? How diverse is diverse enough? Because what this is, is this is wokeness invading classical Christian education. And even if a proponent of the diversification of classical Christian curriculum and the great books tradition would say that they are not woke, somebody like Jessica Houghton Wilson, who's leading the charge for diversification, claims that she's not woke, you can claim that all you want, but you're woke. Your actions are woke because this is a postmodern neo-Marxist approach to the canon it's not based on whether or not the works that we use are virtuous and godly and worthy of study and help build the greatest culture that ever existed by the grace of God because it was Christian, the Christian West. It's not about that. It's about whether or not there's enough diversity within the curriculum, and that, that's a huge problem. It takes focus away from what I would say is the primary purpose of education, certainly of a classical Christian education, which is the passing on of the Christian West, that culture, that heritage, to the next generation. And that's what happened for so long, and that's what built up the greatness of the West as it started with the Greeks and then moved to the Romans and then moved to Christian Europe and is now has spread its influence, Christianity certainly, across the entire globe. And so we want to pass on that tradition, but diversity, calls for diversity, essentially it's affirmative action for the great books program. Those kinds of things detract from that message and you're no longer focused on those things when you're focused on diversity. And if you give wokeness an inch, it's going to take an it's going to take a mile. If you let it in the door, if you let that camel's nose under the tent, you're going to find that the tent's collapsed and you're going to see the camel just standing there. And that's what's going to end up happening. We've seen this in other other areas when you let in, you know, homosexuality and transgenderism, that sort of diversity into our culture. It's infiltrated movies, television shows, <clears throat> music, books, even video games. Even video games are ultra woke now with transgender character options and homosexual relationship options and all sorts of things like that. So you're, you're, you're asking for this. It seems so sweet and innocent to many people, but it's not. It's not sweet and innocent when you play the diversity game. And diversity, diversity is not a virtue. It's not a virtue like temperance, courage, wisdom, justice, faith, hope, or love. It's not. It's, it's not something that's virtuous. So it's not as if you're trying to put something in 
diversity that's going to add to what's going on or is going is a legitimate substitute for other educational goals you're not you're bringing in something that's just a poison and that just kills and destroys everything true good and beautiful that it touches so that's one response is to say yes to it <clears throat> you can also just say you know, one of kind of two other responses you can do here one thing you can do is you can reject it and it's just with a simple no without much of a qualification so you should diversify your curriculum you should we should diversify the great books tradition we should put in more minorities well i think i kind of already touched upon this but again where does it end what's the goal when is it enough blacks what about asians and which asians the chinese tradition the japanese tradition the korean tradition the black American tradition, the black African tradition, the Latin American tradition, Mexican authors, Guatemalan authors. Who, who are we talking about? North, you know, Latin America, so Central American or South American. When is it, when are you diverse enough? What's the goal? When does it end? And you can just say no to that. No, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to focus on instead is passing on the culture and this tradition of the Christian West onto the next generation. That's going to be my focus. Diversity is not a virtue. It's a massive distraction and it's a poison. So I said no to it. You can also essentially say, I don't care. So I'll use myself as an example. So I teach one of my classes that I teach is a great books class uh, to seniors. And every single one of the books we read, except for one is authored by a man. We read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And every single one of the books we read, except for one, is authored by a white person, with that exception being the book of Deuteronomy, which was authored by Moses. Pretty sure Moses wasn't white. Pretty sure he was a dark-skinned, Middle Eastern-looking man. Any anthropologists out there, <clears throat> feel free to correct me. But if somebody were to say, you know, your curriculum's too white and too male, my response would be, I do not care. What I do care about is passing on the tradition and cultural heritage of the Christian West onto the next generation. I do not care about diversity checklists. I do not care about diversifying my curriculum. I do not care about bending over backwards to try to find authors from other countries and with different skin colors because we already have a corpus and a curriculum and a tradition that's excellent, that's great, that's virtuous, that has built up phenomenal culture and civilization after culture and after civilization. And I'm going to continue to focus on those things <clears throat> rather than these woke distractions that will end up derailing, <coughs> excuse me, the classical Christian movement. So that was the first one, wokeness and diversity within classical Christian education. Just say no to it. And the second thing I want to touch upon is a quote from this book right here, Postmodern Times by Gene Edward Beeth, the book that I've been reading for, goodness gracious, months now. I just keep getting distracted by other books, but I'm actually almost done with it. I think I'm really towards the end, but I was looking over it and I came across this quote I highlighted uh, in the middle of the book, and here's what it says. I found this fascinating, so I'm going to read it and then provide some of my own comments on it. Our tendency in the postmodern age is to evaluate everything in terms of its entertainment value. Judging a worship service according to how entertaining it is misses the point. Choosing a church because we like the music or because the preacher tells funny jokes is dangerous. So Veef is completely correct with his analysis. Uh, first thing I want to comment on is where he says, judging a worship service according to how entertaining it is misses the point. He's completely correct. So I don't often agree with Rick Warren, um, but one thing that I agree with him about is the opening line to his book, Purpose Driven Life. The opening line to that book is, it's not about you. <clears throat> and I would echo that same sentiment here. Worship service is not about you. Sunday morning is not about you. It's about worshiping the holy triune God, the king of glory. That's what it's about. It's about coming together with the saints, reciting the scriptures together, confessing sin together out loud, singing songs, hymns, and or psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to a glorious and mighty God together as a congregation, not listening to a worship pastor in skinny jeans with a band that's playing music louder than the congregation is singing with smoke machines and things like that. It's not about listening to a pastor give a feel-good TED Talk for 15 to 20 minutes because it capitulates to your ever-shrinking attention span. It's about listening to a preacher rightly divide the Word of God and teach sound doctrine. It's about taking communion, witnessing baptisms. That's what 
Sunday mornings are about. They're not about you. They're not about how you feel. And they're certainly not about <clears throat> you being entertained. It's a sacred place where you come to meet a holy God on his terms, not on your feelings and your desires to be entertained. Uh, the next thing that Vith writes in here that I want to comment on, choosing a church because we like the music or because the preacher tells funny jokes is dangerous. Yeah, he's right. And what this reminds me of is the old saying, what you save them with is what you save them to. So if you save somebody with a rock and worship band that sounds like they just got off the stage at the Caleb Music Awards and a pastor who treats Sunday morning sermons like stand-up comedy routines or like a TED talk, then you're going to win them to that expectation. <clears throat> they're going to expect that from uh, their pastor all the time, from all pastors, and they're going to expect that sort of a musical worship experience. And if they lose that, then you end up losing them. And they're never going to dive into more sacred, meatier, deeper, more mature elements of Sunday morning worship if they're being fed this non-fat milk version of a Sunday morning all the time with a worship band that sounds like it has it's played on top 40 Christian radio and <clears throat> a pastor who's interested in making sure people walk away from church feeling good rather than feeling convicted and wanting to confess sin and wanting to live as better Christians because the word of God cut deep uh, to their heart. So Veith is spot on there with, with his analysis. And the whole idea of what you save them with is what you save them to. It's like the idea of if you save them with the idea of Jesus really not caring all that much about your homosexuality or your transgenderism. He just wants to accept you as you are and love you, and that, but you're never going to confront people with their sins like the Bible does when they finally do get confronted with their sins by a pastor or by reading the scripture, then they're just going to either abandon the faith or they're going to go to a church that's more liberal and that accepts their sin. They call it a lifestyle, but accepts their sin. So that's, that's the issue with that. And that's some of the things that Veith is hitting on there in his book and just a couple of the thoughts and comments that I wanted to have on it or that I had on it. <clears throat> so the last thing is an article from the Gospel Coalition that I would like to uh, read read you something that I wrote about it. So let's get right into it. The Gospel Coalition recently published and consequently deleted an article titled Seven Things Christians Can Learn from Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. You'd think an unmarried 30-year-old woman who attends her church's singles ministry and lives alone with a parakeet wrote the article. Well, you'd be wrong. The article was penned by a man who functions as a pastoral resident at his church, pursues an MDiv at Reformed Theological Seminary, and is a self-proclaimed Swifty. Lord, help him. The Gospel Coalition often jettisons articles that receive content-related blowback. Several months ago, they tossed Pastor Josh Butler headfirst under the bus after his article, Sex Won't Save You, But It Points to the One Who Will, an article that the Gospel Coalition happily and voluntarily published, faced a fierce firestorm for its content. Feminist evangelicals and soft men lined up in droves in an effort to unperson Pastor Butler and his article. It's true that the article reeked of gross erotic language as it sexualized the relationship between Christ and his church, but there was TGC, right on cue, deleting the article and issuing a groveling apology. The Gospel Coalition saved face, at least as far as they were concerned, but helped destroy a man in the process. TGC not only deleted his article, but his church subsequently fired him. Butler resigned from the Keller Center, who also published his article, and TGC uninvited him from speaking at their conference. The Gospel Coalition shrank like a violet under the scrutiny of feminists and effeminate men who stirred up a social media frenzy over the article. TGC as a whole is a Christian ministry run almost exclusively by women, and that includes most of the men. Like a bunch of cowards, these male editors avoided criticism by throwing one of their own contributors, 
a man whose article they vetted themselves to the wolves. More on the vetting process in a moment. <clears throat> TGC has a history of covert article removals as well. A year or two ago, during the height of the Kyle Rittenhouse hype, TGC published an article by a black pastoral contributor who claimed that Kyle Rittenhouse's self-defense shooting of multiple attackers was akin to Dylan Roof's slaughter of blacks in the name of white supremacy. Dylan Roof murdered black members of a predominantly black church because, well, they were black, while Kyle Rittenhouse defended himself from a mob of filth hell-bent on looting, pillaging, and killing Kyle Rittenhouse. How did TGC respond to the justified backlash it faced for slandering Rittenhouse? By editing the article, an article that changed practically none of the original content, and by hiding it from searches on their website. Two separate outlets, getting back to the vetting issue, two separate outlets published a piece that I wrote around a year ago. One was the school I work for, the other was Classus, a classical Christian education-themed magazine. When submitting the article to my school for publication on their blog, my headmaster and principal edited the piece nearly half a dozen times. After going through that editing process, the folks at Classus edited it even further. Now, if a small private school and a magazine published for a niche audience require their writers to go through that many pains to get published, then how stringent does one suppose an international parachurch ministry's vetting process is? TGC has no one to blame for any of these debacles but themselves. <clears throat> Every article they published, be it Butler's, the one about Rittenhouse, or the Taylor Swift piece, they edited and they vetted. As for the Taylor Swift article itself, it is as gay and effeminate as one would expect, not to mention a practical how-to manual for idol worship. A few of the more egregious lines from the piece include, quote, It wasn't just Swifties who noticed the shimmering attire of Taylor fans. Taylor's dresses became more visible when worn by her followers. Through Swifties, the world saw Swift. One of the great joys and privileges given to Christians is to put on Christ, to put his sparkling attributes on display to a watching world. We were created to shimmer as jewels on the crown of Christ's head. Each era's show begins with a climactic unveiling of Taylor Swift from beneath a, beneath a giant canvas of pink petals. The roar of the Chicago crowd when Taylor was unveiled was deafening. One of my friends reflected on this moment. When Taylor was revealed, her appearance seemed flawless. I had high expectations, but when the petals came off, I wasn't disappointed. Somehow, she was more beautiful than I imagined, end quote. Remember, a man wrote this. <clears throat> Let us continue on. Quote, It's hard to explain what I felt when I woke up the morning after seeing Taylor Swift. The best way I can describe it is sad joy. For all the happy anticipation leading up to the show, the sorrowful realization that it was over tainted my joy. For that, for many, that sorrow started earlier. A friend said, It felt like the experience was ending the moment I woke up the day of the concert. My joy was ending as it was starting. She said this pain continued into the show itself. As joyous as it was to see Taylor, we all grieved as we celebrated because we knew the joy would soon be gone. End quote. <laughs> well, choose this day whom you will emulate, whether it be the homosexual adjacent contributors to the Gospel Coalition or the organization's cowardly editors. As for me and my house, we will serve the masculine and courageous King of Glory, Jesus the Christ. Well, thank you all so very much for swinging by and checking out today's episode. Apparently my son just crawled in here and is down on the floor hanging out. I hope you enjoyed it. I truly appreciate every single one of you that stopped by and watched the episode, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment. It means a lot to me. If you could continue to do things like that, it would continue to mean a lot to me. Well, have a happy Thanksgiving. It's just a few days away. And Lord willing, we will catch you next Monday for the next episode of the Jason Modar Show. God bless you guys.